Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Handy George School for our new course, uh, the growth, expansion, and death of single tax campaigns in the United States. Our lecturer tonight is Ed Dodson. Ed is a, a longtime lecturer at the Handy George School. Uh, he has a career in finance. I think by now you should all be familiar with him. So Ed is going to be leading this class for uh, the next uh, five weeks. Ed, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Ibrahima. Uh, I hope this will be uh, a subject that's, that's going to be as interesting to you as it was to me to research the details. Um, and I encourage your your questions and, and any comments you care to make. Um, it's likely that some of you may have some details that I don't have or haven't come across as I researched this story. But uh, what I'm going to talk about over the next several weeks, and I don't know if it'll take five weeks, depending upon uh, how much participation you, you uh, contribute to these lectures. I don't know if it'll take five weeks to get through the material or not, but, but as long as it, it takes, we will continue. But this is the story of the national political campaigns that were undertaken by single taxers in the late 19th century, uh, all the way up until the 1920s. Uh, it doesn't mean that political activism in, within the Georgia's community uh, ended there. Uh, it certainly has continued, but, uh, but this is a period of time when members of the Henry George community thought that they could really achieve change by political organization, uh, as well as education. So it's a very complex story. And there are some key individuals who drove the story for several decades. And we'll, we'll uh, go over who those individuals are and why they're important uh, for your understanding. So there's this initial uh, photograph from the archives shows a single tax league meeting. So this, this activity went around the world. It wasn't just the United States, but I'm focusing on the US uh, for this series of lectures. So there were a number of single taxers who believed that only by forming an independent political party would the single tax program gain any momentum. And in December of 1887, Louis F. Post wrote an open letter in uh, Henry George's newspaper, The Standard, expressing his views on the strategy. He offered his uh, fellow single taxers a very practical assessment of the situation. Here's what he said at the time. If the party will perfect a national organization and by general consent make nominations for Congress and for nothing else, all over the country, we shall not only be an important factor in national politics, but we may put enough men into Congress to make an effective third party caucus there. So he was at that point fairly optimistic that the single taxers could in fact secure a number of positions in the, in the national legislature as well as in state government. He continues, he says, having but one candidate to work and vote for and caring nothing about the bearing, the bear baiting, whether the Republican dogs tore the Democratic bear or the Democratic bear squeezed the Republican dogs, our party would be in a position to seriously disturb the political situation, especially in the pivotal city of the pivotal state. So he's looking at, at, at the single taxers as providing a, a influential third, third party caucus so that they could shift the emphasis of what legislation was being discussed and throw their votes where they thought they could be uh, significant, whether or not it might be behind Democrats who, who took the leadership or Republicans, as long as on issues they were consistent with what single taxes believed would be, in fact, the way to go. So he, can, he, he ends his, his statement this way. A party representing the principles of government for which we are struggling and entering into a presidential campaign with such a policy might be sneered at or swore at, but it wouldn't be laughed at or ignored. And so that's where Louis Post came into, into this position. He was Henry, Henry George's right-arm man, uh, 
along with Tom L. Tom L. Johnson, they were probably his two strongest supporters in the political arena. And Post uh, was uh, was someone to be reckoned with as as his later career demonstrated when he entered the Will Wilson administration. And when we get to that part of the story, you'll you'll see how important that is. I, I should say um, that. Um, we just we just finished the interview with the historian Christopher England of his new book, which is titled Land and Liberty, Henry George and the Crafting of Modern Liberalism. Um, I wrote the this series of lectures before uh, I knew anything about the book. Um, but this book is required reading for anyone who wants to understand this period. Uh, Christopher England has done a marvelous job at at bringing to life much of the, the details of the story I'm going to tell you in these next several weeks. So what did the single taxers do? Well, a convention of the single taxers were held, was held in 1890 in New York City's Cooper Union. Uh, and at this convention, they established what they called the Single Tax League of the United States to be a representative body with one member from each state or territory. So you can see how serious they were in making this a national effort. How did they get attention? Well, during the election of 1896, single taxers formed the single tax party to wage a concerted effort to gain control of Delaware's state government. Uh, they believed that because Delaware was such a small state, a nationally organized campaign would have disproportionate influence there. Uh, the campaigners pictured here were arrested, <clears throat> in fact, for violating Delaware's blue laws that prohibited public speaking on Sundays. And when they were in the Dover jail, they formed a single tax club in the jail. Uh, the campaign ultimately failed. Uh, the people of Delaware felt put upon by all of these people coming from outside the state, pressuring them to uh, vote, you know, for the single tax party. Um, but they learned valuable lessons in that campaign, to be sure. Single taxers were organizing local and state parties all across the United States at the same time. Um, this is a photograph of Philadelphia of the era, and the single tax party of Philadelphia was formed, and they held a convention in November of 1898 for the purposes of choosing a candidate for mayor of, of the city of Philadelphia. Um, unfortunately, uh, that, that candidate did not win, but that didn't really deter the single taxers at all. They looked at this as a learning process and they were trying to build a constituency. Assessment of the party situation in Chicago appeared in the 29 November 1902 issue of Post Newspaper The Public. Um, and in in the public, here's what Louis Post had to say about the party. Notwithstanding that there is a strong single tax sentiment in Chicago, this experiment in third party politics made the poor showing of only 500 votes at its first trial. At the second, its vote increased 100 percent, which indicated simply as a matter of percentage an early triumph. And he goes on to say, this indication was emphasized at the third trial when, by dint of computing the votes for local candidates, an aggregate of nearly 2,000 was footed up, making another increase of 100%. But at the recent election, that vote fell as much as 50% or more. This is in accord with the general experience of permanent side parties. So what he's what he's really telling you there is that uh, eventually people, voters tend not to go out of their comfort zone with regard to the support of the main parties, which is why in the United States, there's always been great difficulty for a third party gaining uh, any kind of real support from the public, despite the merits of its policies and uh, et cetera. So the single taxers were going through that same kind of experience in their early years. In 1907, 
The American Single Tax League was established at a national conference that was held in November of that year. Bolton Hall, a lawyer and the author of many books, was selected as president. And so you have someone who has a a broad public constituency already as an author. Bolton Hall uh, sold quite a few quite a few books and was a well recognized public personality at the time. To have him involved in the single tax league as a main speaker was a real asset at the time. And of course, uh, the single tax movement found its greatest financial support from the industrialist and philanthropist Joseph Fels. In 1909, Fels announced that he would contribute $25,000 a year for five years, provided an equal sum could be raised. And so uh, Fels became the, the main instrument to get people uh, active in support of various initiatives. It wasn't just political activism. Joseph Fels uh, was also a very strong supporter of the utopian experiments that were being established, uh, not just in the U.S., but elsewhere. Funded, funded a number of agricultural farm communities in England that were designed to, to provide employment and training and homes for unemployed workers. And of course, he was one of the principal uh, funders for the purchase of land down in, um, in Alabama on, Fair, on, uh, on Mobile Bay that became Fairhope. Well, Joseph Fells was married uh, to Mary, his wife, and while she was a single taxer, she was also a de dedicated Zionist. And so if you read Fell's biography, you find that, that after a while, Mary shifted most of the remainder of their, their estate to the Zionist movement and away from the single tax movement. But initially, when, when Fells died in 1916, his wife, came forward and suggested the formation of a new organization to take the place of the Joseph Fells Fund. And so the National Single Tax League was formed um, at the sixth National Single Tax Convention held in Niagara Falls, New York in August. A national com committee that was composed of officers elected by the entire membership uh, carried out most of the work and Daniel Kiefer, who was formerly of the Fells Fund, served as the first chairman. So the Fells Fund, which had been the primary instrument of funding, was replaced by the National Single Tax League. Any questions so far? You've been very patient while I've gone through the first uh, part of the, the, the slides. Anybody have a question or a comment? Okay, so here's a uh, Michael. Michael, always nice to see you. Have you here? Yes, I, I was particularly struck by the one of your first remarks, Edward, uh, about the third party. We have third parties who tried to get into power. We had the Liberals in England, obviously, and and and, and there was a strange phenomenon. The, the, the strange death of liberal England, as it were, <laughs> and then we, that, which was a famous time, but we we are now ensconced that no political party, it, it's it's the two party system, Labour and Conservative in this country, um, and occasionally you get a, an a, 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 what happens in that situation is you get one party cannot quite get a majority, so they have to have a bit of influence from a third smaller party and they can exert considerable effect we've had the liberals and we've had the, you know the you know the ireland um uh, small parties exerting extraordinary uh, unmerited influence really because they you know whatever but i just wonder about this whether it's an inevitability uh, this third party cannot seem to get enough uh, leverage really uh, in pursuing it. So I, I'm, I was particularly struck by that 
phenomenon and it's the same in America, obviously. I guess my only response is that history bears out that it's extremely difficult to to uh, to bring a new party into being and convince people to leave uh, their the previous party. In the United States, um, independents are the largest group of voters. Um, so there are far more people who, who aren't associated with either Democrat or Republican Party who think of themselves as independent. Uh, and so it's very you know, difficult for a party, let's say, like the Green Party or the Libertarians or even the Socialist Party to uh, get enough votes to get anyone elected. And so uh, it doesn't stop people from trying. And it certainly didn't stop the single taxers from trying, not not just in the United States, but but in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, as well. Although, uh, as you probably remember or know, it was the liberals who initially carried the Georgist cause in the UK. And and eventually uh, the liberals lost their place in the in the uh, hierarchy and labor. Uh, and and the Tories you know, fought it out from that that point on for for up until right now. Yeah. Um, although the Green Party in Europe and I and I suspect in the UK is stronger in that than it is in the United States. Um, I, I, you know, I, you know, I worry about the Green Party. Uh, I just don't know what they mean by being a Green. I, I just don't understand it really. But but, but it's. Uh, it's the liberals that seem to cling on, as it were, uh, in in spite of their loss of um, of dominance, really. And, and it, it, it it's almost as though there has to be them and us, as it were, all, all the time. And 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 they and the political debate and 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 the innovation that they try to put forward is is, is so biased, one way or another, that that, that it's you know you you. You have to throw your hands up in despair, really, that, that it has to be them and us. And they've got to be wrong always. And you've got to be right always. And and, and obviously the other way around. I just I just find it an impossible situation. I just sit back and think of England, as it were. <laughs> well, when we compare you know, the parliamentary democracy with our system of you know constitutional democracy here in the United States, uh, there are constant debates over which system um, results in the better governance. Mm. Uh, and I, you know, I, we could have, we could have a, a lot of debates if we had several other people from different countries join us, we could have a real interesting discussion of the pros and cons of our various uh, systems of government. I mean, certainly uh, what we're talking about, the single taxers, um, they weren't just about getting tax reform. They weren't just about even uh, free trade. They very much saw the need to uh, bring about certain systemic reforms associated with the form the form of the government takes. And so, uh, as, and that's really the the value of Christopher England's book. He really yeah. goes into that in some depth. And so I, uh, Michael, you would definitely love to read this book. You should get hold of a copy. Well, I do already have a copy and I'm starting to read it very much. Okay. Uh, so uh, here's a notice that appeared in the Pittsburgh Press on the 14th of October, 1916, that announced a public event featuring Robert C. McCauley, who was the single tax party's camp candidate for the United States Senate at the time. And, and I'll read it to you. The newly organized single tax party will make its first appearance in Pittsburgh tonight with two of its campaigners, when two of its campaigners will address an open air meeting downtown. The speakers will be Robert C. McCauley, editor of the Single Tax Herald and the party's candidate for United States Senator and James H. Dix, state secretary of the party, who is also the candidate for Congress in the Bucks Montgomery district. Now, in the research that I've done, 
I have not been able to find very much press coverage across the country for candidates running on the single tax party. Um, the, the most ambitious campaign occurred in California. In 1916, a group of California single taxers initiated a campaign that, that was designed to amend the state constitution that would call for the capture of the rental value of all privately held land in the state, uh, and that revenue would be used for public purposes. So they they went for a systemic reform, a, and a direct amendment to the state constitution that would bring about the single tax in one you know step. Uh, what was achieved and what needed to, to follow was debated during the 1917 National Single Tax Conference held in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So uh, other, other single taxers around the country were looking at this, this great adventure campaign in California, trying to decide, is it in fact something we should try to emulate? Um, it was expensive. Um, it took a lot of effort. Uh, and the results are written up as, as follows. It was through the initiative and referendum that the large vote in California was polled, but it is considered by many that a party would give much needed political backing to an initiative and referendum vote. In any case, an organization and party form to watch the vote in the separate districts and collect and certify the returns is needed. So they were concerned about, about honesty. It wasn't just in New York and Tammany Hall, the machine politics all across the United States and all the way to California raised concerns about whether or not these elections were, were going to be you know, honest. And so the initiative and referendum was a major uh, new systemic reform that was being introduced. Um, Oregon was one of, the, one of the states that adopted the INR, and in California, that was what what the the Great Adventure was trying to do to get in order to get the single tax brought into play. Subsequent campaigns after 1917 could not be undertaken uh, because the nation's entry into the First World War, and so. As, as I'm sure occurred in the UK and in other countries, once the First World War started, all everything else sort of was put on the back burner. Certainly people were entered military service and, and entered the fighting. Um, the, 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 the assets of every nation were redirected towards military uh, preparedness and the war itself. And a lot of the momentum that had been achieved in the first decade or so of the of the 20th century was actually lost because of the war. Um, also, the architect of the Great Adventure campaign in California, this man, James Griffiths, died in March of 1919. And there was no one who picked up the level of, of, of uh, uh, energy to fight this again once the war was over. They did bring about the camp. They, they tried it again in 1920, 1921. And in 1922, the campaign resulted in just 125,000 signatures in support of the single tax amendment to the state constitution. Um, and a, a final and also unsuccessful effort was made in 1923 and then dropped. So that was the lesson of, of the great adventure in California. They tried it by by getting an amendment to the state constitution. They just could not convince enough people uh, in California that it was in their interest to, to take it all the way. Uh, this was something new uh, to, to most people. It was troublesome because how are you gonna implement this? Who is it gonna affect? Is it gonna affect me? Is it gonna affect my neighbor? Uh, you know, they're, this is still an era when people were very much looking to the ownership of land to provide for their financial future. I mean, it was well understood that buying land, holding it, and eventually selling it already was, was the source of, of increasing your, your net worth, your, your personal well-being. So how would, how would a single tax affect me as an individual? Uh, and not enough people had the kind of public spirit or could really 
get their arms around their head around uh, the idea of changing the whole tax structure in the way that the single taxers were asking. In 1917, the National Single Tax League began publishing a monthly bulletin uh, to serve as its public organ. organ. And, and this was uh, one of the, er the early issues in January. So this is their opening announcement. How we stand, they say, the prospects of making contributions to the fund reach the desired $50,000 mark, continue encouraging. The total subscribed to date is something over $33,000, yet we never do so well, but that we can and should do better. This is no time to rest and congratulate ourselves on what has been accomplished until the single tax has been placed beyond recall upon the statute books. There must be no cessation of effort. So you know, fundraising was a big, big part. If, if they were going to be politically active, uh, they needed the funds. And up to this point, it had been a fairly small number of individuals who were the main supporters financially of the, of the whole movement. When uh, high expectations failed to materialize in 1918, the National Committee came under a lot of harsh criticism from Joseph Dana Miller, who was editor of the Single Tax Review. So they were they were constantly arguing over strategy. Uh, not only Miller, but other prominent single taxers felt that the Single Tax League had not done enough to support the political efforts that were underway at the state and local, le local levels. So in a stridently worded editorial published in the May-June issue of the Review, Miller called for the formation of a new national body. Uh, he had his own ideas of what would be successful. He says, now that this movement, in a sense, must begin all over again, again, because of the, you know, the interruption of the war, and because we are in a serious time, yet a time fraught with opportunity, the National League is a positive obstacle in the way. Real work is beginning. And this real work must no longer be hampered by activities which are purely fiction, by a paper organization whose chief purpose has been to collect funds to circulate flimsies and to glorify favorites, to starve out local work and to spend the money of single taxers with reckless prodigality. So uh, um, there, there's dissension in the ranks. Um, you know, those of us who have been involved with the Georgia's movement and, and Georgia's community for some time, we've all experienced this kind of debate and discussion. Is what we're doing uh, the right thing to be doing? Are we spending the money in the right way? There have always been critics of how uh, the available funds in the movement have been spent. Is it too much on activism, too much on education, too much on this, too much on that? Uh, and I think what in hindsight, certainly I've come to understand is that what we have been trying to accomplish is almost next is next to impossible. It doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying to, to do it. Uh, but we are, you know, running against the wind. We're fighting the history and, uh, for a very long time. History was moving rapidly against our perspectives and our principles. Um, I do think, however, that we are entering a new era. The old ideas have pretty much failed. And so it may be time that people will begin to look at what these, this generation, that what I'm talking about of single taxes, what they had to say uh, through us and maybe give give us far more attention as people who are thoughtful and considerate uh, to what is needed to be done. And that's what they were they were attempting to do at a time when, in fact, um, the opportunity to make change in the direction of the single tax movement was being challenged in so many ways. And, and, and on the one hand, by the socialists and Marxists, and on the other by those who are defenders of the status quo. 
In August of 1918, the National Committee of the National Single Tax League accepted the resignation of Daniel Kiefer. Um, he was accused in the review of harboring, harboring quote, pro-German leanings. And they elected uh, Louis Jerome Johnson, uh, who was a professor uh, of economics, uh, to uh, um, become the chairman uh, of the party. And he was at the time the chairman of the Massachusetts Single Tax League. Well, despite the change in leadership, Joseph Dana Miller and others continue to call for a new national organization. And so at the national convention held in June of 1919, the National Single Tax Party was formed and adopted a national single tax platform. The preamble called out for support from those who truly sought a just society. And this is just a, a cartoon that talks about the situation at the time. You see the sea of poverty and misery, um, the unemployed, and the people's land and land and loan measure. I guess that was one of the policies that they were talking about. So anyway, the platform uh, said this. Our government was founded to ensure a condition of justice to all its people. Laws which authorize intrusions on individual rights or that permit some to prey on others reflect a debased public conception of human relationships and morals. We call upon all men who have a love of country in their hearts and a desire that our nation be, may be established in prosperity and justice and who believe in equal rights to all and special privileges to none to join this party, take part in its councils and assist in its work. To the end that the principles enunciated in this platform may be established in our laws. So right up front, they're, they're calling for you know, fundamental systemic reform. And the question is, would, would people respond? Um, in Ohio, the platform of the Single Tax Party of Ohio echoed these, the fundamental theme of reform that, that, that the National Party uh, was, was advocating. It states as follows. We demand the abolishment of all taxes, both direct and indirect, except one single tax, which shall take for public purposes the full rental value of land, exclusive of all improvements and all other products of labor. So there's there's already in the in the in the movement uh, this acceptance that what they have to achieve first is tax reform. Um, rather than calling for land nationalization, as did Henry George in his writings, the members of the single tax community realize that that they have to convince people that their version of public policy is going to affect them more positively than the status quo. And so they continue to hammer, hammer away at, at th that, that what's wrong with the country is how its revenue is being raised by government. They respond to socialists as follows. They say, they say socialists claim that the evil lies in capitalism. We deny this and claim that the evil lies in monopolism, monopoly by the few of the natural resources of the planet Earth, or in other words, the monopoly of the land on and from which men must live. Now, think about today, what's going on. There's a resurgence of interest in socialist ideas. Um, there's, you know, there are many, many speakers on the internet all the time talking about uh, a different kind of democratic socialism than was advocated by, you know, the Marxist and Lenin and Lenin, et cetera, or Mao and all that. 
somehow uh, somehow the socialists have managed to say we recognize that what we try to to bring about uh, in the early 20th century had problems. And so we we still think that socialism has value, but we believe that it's a different kind of socialism than what you think might be defined as socialism. Well, where where do the single taxers, you know, where do we as as advocates, proponents of Henry George's principles and philosophy, where do we fit in that dialogue? Are we mostly libertarian or are we, you know, reformed capitalists? What is the message that we need to bring, you know, to the public today in order to get the attention? Well, that was the same issue that that uh, the single taxers in 1915 or 1920 were trying to deal with. How do we how do we bring our message to the public in an effective way? And part of that, you know, public was was going to be people who were, you know, adversely impacted by. Um, you know the laws of the of the of the of the of the country at the time, including blacks. I mean, one of one of the constituencies that that single taxers were trying to reach uh, was, in fact, you know, the black community. So, in addition to the national platform, there's a photograph of of the single taxers. You'll notice I've I've looked. I don't see any. Uh, African Americans or persons of color in the picture, but they were still trying to appeal to the the folks who were both most oppressed by by society by a series of resolutions. One of which read as follows: A pledge to the Negro equality of opportunity under the single tax and in the enlightenment of all rights guaranteed to all people under the Constitution of the United States. Um, there was some you know, attraction. I the, the history books tell us that there were African Americans who gravitated to the single tax and began to support it, even even though in the south southern states of the United States, they you know had very great difficulty even expressing themselves at the ballot box. So in July of 1920, the National Single Tax Party had its second annual convention. And here they nominated Macaulay for president in the upcoming election. And he had already run for the Senate. And as well, he ran for governor of Pennsylvania in 1918 as a single tax party candidate. And he was chairman of the Pennsylvania Single Tax Party. So uh Richard Barnum, I really don't I haven't been able to find a whole lot of information about him, but he stood for the seat office of vice president in that election along with Macaulay. Single taxers also were trying to bring in suffragists into the movement as much as possible. <laughs> so they were very much supportive of giving women the right to right to vote. At the 1920 election, the suffragist leader, Carrie Chapman Catt, was nominated to be the party's vice presidential, presidential candidate, but she did not win the nomination. Um, and how active she was in the single tax party, I have not really been able to discover, but I haven't really researched her biography. Well, in 1920, they consistently campaigned for the full adoption of the single tax as the only program to solve the nation's social and economic problems. So they're still, you know, very much hammering away, going for full throttle. The idea of advocating for land value taxation as a local property tax reform had not yet entered the equation in any serious way. They they were at this point still hoping that the issue could be raised to a national or international level. Let me stop again and see if anybody has any questions or comments so far. I have a question. Far away. 
All right. Uh, I know you mentioned the Delaware campaign. And I suppose that they thought they could create the single tax in the state of Delaware, or they could create land value taxation. I realized that the federal government at that point was simply relying on tariffs. So uh, they obviously weren't going to be able to to replace the tariffs with any, with the land value tax, but the, they couldn't, and they couldn't have created any free land and just by just instituting the single tax in Delaware. So do you know what their thinking was? Well, Mike, they thought that by getting a hold of one state, you know, by getting candidates elected uh, as governor to the state legislature, that they, they if they had a, had one state that had a plurality in the legislature, they could get the legislation passed. They might be able to get an amendment to the state constitution. And so it, that's why they poured all the resources into Delaware. But as you well know, the people of Delaware have a mind of their own. And and they uh, were not really too happy uh, to see all these people come in to try to tell them how to run their state. Yeah. But, but you know, I mean, Frank Stevens. Uh, they, you know, but I guess the, what I'm trying to ask you is, they didn't think they could actually raise wages and all the other stuff uh, that the single tax would do if they got to pass on a national basis. Oh, no, I, th I think they did believe that. I think they did okay. believe that that even if it was adopted by one state, that that state would be a magnet for the kinds of investment activity uh, that Henry George wrote about, that it would stand out as an island of prosperity surrounded by a sea of of inequity but they didn't understand i suppose that that people would move here and then drive wages right back down to the national level <laughs> well if depending upon how successful they were in getting the the state's revenue system changed but i'm saying that if they had gotten a single tax passed in delaware people from every other state that where wages were lower would have moved here and that would have driven the wages back to the common level again and and I was just wondering if they realized that. Or I don't, they... I don't, well, I'm not sure that I agree with your conclusion, Mike. Okay. Um, I mean, the, I mean, what, what Henry George argued is that popular, every person that's born or comes into a, a geography brings with them uh, ability to labor. If you give them ability, the ability to labor, they will produce and they will produce more and more efficiently. And so without land monopoly, and that's what the, that's what Frank Stevens and the others hoped to get rid of in Delaware, uh, wages wouldn't fall with the increase in population coming I, in. I, I know, but Henry George clearly are, uh, postulated, whatever the right word is, that wages are determined by the margin of production. That's that's his big thing, the law of wages. And and. <laughs> It's just like bail. He he makes the point himself. You can't if you bail out the Delaware River. Uh, you better have some way to keep more the ocean from filling it back up. Well, I think I'll, I'll stop because I, no, I think well we'll get you diverted uh, here. Now now we're we're getting into an interesting theoretical discussion, uh, and and, and uh, all I can say is from from what I've read about the campaign. They felt very strongly that they could turn Delaware into an example for the rest of the nation to follow if they were successful. And so they, they, they these guys thought they could do that with Arden, too. Yeah, they, <laughs> they ran up against work. human nature. They didn't understand the theory. <laughs> well, they ran up against human nature. Well, the theory isn't wrong. Uh, the theory that you could raise wages and and lower rents in the in the municipality of Delaware is wrong. Um, <laughs> that's fact. You can observe it today. And land sells for just as much in the city of Arden as it does anywhere in the country. Of course it does. Of course it does because because Arden is not an island of prosperity. In a surrounded by a an environment of inequity, Ar Arden has only moved very minimally in the direction of a single tax community. 
Well, what do you mean? We don't collect any other taxes. We only have a single tax on the value of land. And what percentage of the total rental value is collected? About a third or half. Okay. It's it's not enough to really change the dynamics of the community. It's enough and to it, make And if they'd done the same thing in the state of Delaware, it wouldn't have been enough to change the 200 million people in the United States. Well, you might, may, you know, maybe you're right about that. They were optimistic that this would be, again, it would attract attention to the single tax party, to the single tax movement, that it would bring in more people. Um, and, and it might have. But, but anyway, I apologize for di diverting you. I just thought you might add some insight there. Well, I, only I only from from the material that I've had access to and read about what they plan to do. And they again. I think that they would, have, Frank Stevens and the others would have disagreed with you and your conclusion that wages would fall if they were successful in bringing the single tax into into Delaware. Well, that, that not, new population would create new opportunities, and um, and more investment would come in. There would be more investment in capital goods, and so the demand the demand for labor would be greater than the supply of labor regardless of how much labor came into the state now don't forget my grandparents were right there in that campaign <laughs> <laughs> grandfather my great uncle and all the hetzels my on my mother's side of the family were all involved in that thing and my grandfather was with henry george when he died so i you know i'm not speaking as as sort of a um Boy, air. <laughs> well, I would love to have I, I I would love to have some to see something that your grandfather wrote and some of your relatives wrote about the the uh, expectations. You know, yeah, but yeah, about well, what they thought was going to happen. I can't find it, so that's why I thought you might know. <laughs> no, uh, now uh, it might be that that it, there are documents in the archives of the Henry George School somewhere. That might shed some light on this, so you know, maybe that's a a research project for some enterprising person who has access to those archives in New York. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> well, right. uh, but getting back to the story. Oh, Michael Mara has a question or comment. Join yeah, us, and, Mike. Um, hi. Um, since the uh, since third parties have a lot of difficulty getting anywhere in the U.S. I wondered, did any of them uh, attempt to like form a caucus in each of the two major parties and then run run single tax candidates within a caucus within each party? I wonder if that strategy was ever considered. Well, yes, in that sense. Uh, uh, during the first decade of the 20th century, when when. Uh, when Lewis Post was editor of the public, um, his his editorials were very much supportive of the Democratic Party, but what he called the Democratic part of the Democratic Party. In other words, he he was championing champion championing uh, uh, William Jennings Bryan over, for example, Theodore Roosevelt in those you know, conflicts for the presidents, for the president. And there were numerous uh, single taxers who, who were stalwart members of the Democratic Party um, and who remained uh, outside of this effort to, to create an independent third party. So eventually, you know, I have people like Newton Baker, who became uh, Secretary of War in the Woodrow Wilson administration. Louis Post became Under Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, Frederick Howe was appointed Commissioner of Ellis Island. So many leading members of, of the, you know, the Georgist movement uh, took on roles within the Democratic Party, fighting for the progressive, uh, I would say, the liberal part of the Democratic Party, and against you know the the Democrats who uh, stood for racism and uh, segregation and were opposed to women's suffrage and universal suffrage. So 
it, it's uh it's just indicative of how difficult it was to think about challenging the main parties at the time. Right? I mean, uh, all the money is there, all the power is there in the two parties. And so, yes, some of them formed something of a caucus. And so uh, you had you had several individuals, Tom Johnson, for example, elected to the House of Representatives as a Democrat. Um, and many of the others were frustrated because nothing was happening. In their view, no legislation was coming out of it. No, no basic changes were coming out of it that they could point to. And they still thought that establishing an independent party would be the answer. How to do it uh, and, and how long they're going to stick with it is part of this story. So... Um, the single tax party, however, in 1920 with Macaulay and Barnum at the head of the ticket had very great difficulty in getting on the ballots. He couldn't get enough, uh, signatures on, on petitions to get on the ballot. So it was on the ballot in only eight States. Warren G. Harding, uh, was the Republican party candidate and he won with, uh, 16 million votes. The Democratic Party candidate, James Cox, came in a distant second with 9 million votes. Uh, and the single tax, single taxers, you know, achieved votes in the thousands, not, not a particularly high number at all. But what was most important about this election, in fact, was that women for the first time had acquired the franchise. And so now it becomes even more important than ever for the single taxers who believed in the, the idea of a political party to convince women that they should come along with the single tax movement. And in this case, Carrie Chapman Catt was instrumental uh, in trying to build this support because she founded the League of Women Voters that year uh, during the convention of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And as a result, it was six months later that the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified that gave women the right to vote. Marty. Hey, Ed. Great uh, job. Uh, before I start, I wanted to point out that uh, uh, Lewis Post was Assistant Secretary of Labor. and uh, What did I say? You said agriculture. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem. I just want to uh, let people know. Uh, but he did have uh, involvement uh, uh, during the Palmer raids, where there's a lot of uh, concern about immigrants being uh, communists and such. And he he uh, he he played a, a role of uh, of being a little bit uh, more humanitarian, let's say, than uh, others might uh, be. So, and that's uh, that's also true with Frederick Howe. And as as Chris England, you know, writes in the book, uh, because of that, they were accused of being uh, uh, traitors. Yeah. yeah, see, this is a, another reason for the what you're talking about in the whole thing is all these things that just happened to coalesce to uh, um, take a few dings into the the movement. Um, uh, I mean, we have to we have to remember and understand that. There was a tremendous fear of Bolshevism, you know, because it, it had, uh, you know, established itself in in Russia, and uh, you know, the American American leadership was very much uh, afraid that these immigrants coming from the old world were bringing these these un-American values. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess I didn't want to. At, uh, make a points, but I'm thinking I'm going to hold off uh, giving a critique of uh, my viewpoint until we're further into the uh, the course, because you might uh, cover some of the things and uh, just give a little preview of what I'm... Uh, I, I think the, the movement uh, suffered in 1887 when, uh, when Henry George broke with the socialists, but I'm not going to uh, discuss that at all until further on in. So I think you're doing a good job, though. Hey, well, uh, 
feel free to always add add whatever insights that you have. Um, all I can do, what I'm trying to do is is to stimulate those who come to these lectures to 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 recognize that Georgists and single taxers were uh, important. They weren't just you know a minor fringe group. They had clout. Um, they certainly had clout in the United Kingdom. They had clout in in other countries in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Um, uh, there were there were single taxers in France and in Germany, in uh, in Holland, in uh, Denmark. I mean, not in large numbers, but but they were they were vocal and they were generally people. Uh, who had some standing in the community. Yeah. And that, that's, yeah. I mean, that's, this is all, uh, all a, a valuable lesson for people who are uh, politically active now to look for opportunities, because I think there's, there's always opportunities for us to advance uh, these ideas. And I, and I think, you know, I take the last, you know, five minutes for tonight's uh, session, uh, to just talk about that a little bit, because I think it's really an important message. And, and that as, as we think about trying to have an impact, I mean, we, we do everything we can in an educational, from an educational perspective. Uh, many of our colleagues have, are organizing, uh, you know, at the political level, fighting for, for changes in, in the property tax legislation. And there is a larger arena. Where would we ever be able to elect people to office? Um, it's certainly not in, in the cards right now, but it's certainly possible, I think, that the, the recognition that, that the mixed economy has had problems, that, that the Economists haven't really been able to figure out how to how to put forward policies that, if adopted, would achieve sustainable, you know, growth without harming the environment. All of these issues are are issues that we have responses to and make it can make a contribution to in the public dialogue. And we and we have vehicles like the internet uh, and like Zoom and. And, and what we write and, and the potential to get books published. Uh, all of this helps us find a larger growing audience. Um, and, and so I, I feel optimistic, more optimistic now than I have in many years, that what we have to say is going to find an increasing public audience and that people will think more deeply and not simply d dismiss what we have to say as, oh, that was 19th century ideas by by some uh, newspaper editor. It, this is a real, you know, serious group of people who have something to say. Mm -hmm. And in 1900 and 1910 and 1920, that was what what they were they were bringing forward. These were serious people who had something serious to say, and it was a way to preserve what was good about you know, the Democratic Republic and about, you know, capitalism in quotes and eliminate what was bad about it. And that was rentier privilege and monopoly. And so that's what their the political campaign uh, was was designed to bring to the public and try to get the people to understand that that was the situation that they needed to change. And so Next week, we'll pick it up uh, from this point. Um, there are still many more individuals who, who've come into the story, and they're still convinced that that a, a independent political movement is doable. There are others who are going to say, no, it's time to fold up that tent and let's figure out how we can affect what the Democratic and Republic, Republican parties are supporting? How can we be an influence on the thoughtful people in those two main parties in order to get them to see that it's in the interest of not only their constituency, 
but in the growth of their own party to support ideas that come out of the single tax platform. And so that's what we'll we'll pick up next week. Any last comments, uh, questions? Uh, uh, Ibrahima, do you have anything you want to say before we leave tonight? Uh, well, uh, just to announce that we will be starting a new class on Wednesday with Stephen Taft, Rethinking Economics. Uh, other than that, we will meet again for Ed's session two next week. Good night. I thank, thank you all. Thanks so much, Ed.